Hi, my name is Nick Jody, and um, this is a research product that I've been working on for the past nine months with uh, Min Sung Kim and Ilias Tagopoulos, who is my advisor. Uh, and the research is focused on hypothesis generation for antibiotic resistance using machine learning techniques. Um, so real quick, uh, uh, an overview um, of antibiotic, antibiotic resistance. Uh, it's when medicines or antibiotics for treating some type of infection or disease is losing its effect uh, because of some type of microbe change, uh, the underlying microbes, so a mutation acquiring some type of new genetic information. Um, and the World Health Organization uh, uh, is, is stating that antibiotic resistance is reaching alarming levels. Uh, a study uh, in the United States in 2013 said that over 2 million people were infected by bacteria resistant to antibiotics, and of those, 23,000 deaths occurred. And the overall societal cost, up to 20 billion direct and up to 30 billion indirect. So this is a bit of an issue that uh, is currently happening. So the disease that we are focusing our attention to right now for our research is E. coli, uh, but this approach can be generalized to other uh, different diseases. Um, but E. coli, is, the types of the symptoms that you get from this is uh, foodborne illnesses, urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, meningitis, uh, and recently there was an E. coli outbreak with romaine lettuce, if any of you guys are familiar with that, but it, it impacted 32 states, 172 illnesses, 75 hospitalizations, uh, 20 kidney failures, and one death. So it is, it is a problem, and it is impacting the U.S. In terms of antibiotic resistance, there have been high rates of resistance to last-generation drugs, which are kind of like our last line of defense in fighting uh, disease. And when this actually happens, uh, for example, um, the third-generation cephalosporins, which is uh, a late-stage antibiotic that's kind of one of our last-stage defenses, if, an ant if, a, if a strand of E. coli can resist this type of antibiotic, there's a 23.6% death rate. So it is a pretty, pretty significant issue. So in, in terms of kind of fighting this or combating this antibiotic resistance, uh, the, uh, a lot of research has been uh, put into identifying the gene that's causing the problem. Uh, and, and there's a, a lot of the research has been focused on the metagenomic sequence data of these genes to kind of predict whether or not a gene will uh, confer resistance to a, a particular antibiotic. Um, but uh, there, there hasn't been much research into exploring other types of data that we can look at, other relational data. Uh, for instance, what if a gene is involved in some type of molecular function or biological process, or a gene activates another gene that uh, could infer, uh, uh, confer resistance to a particular antibiotic? Maybe if we look into all this other additional information, maybe we can produce, uh, you know, more quality predictions. So that's exactly what we decided to look into. The approach is graph inference. Uh, the idea behind it is we're going to leverage a relational, uh, a, a relational database known as a knowledge graph or a knowledge base. Um, and, and, and this knowledge graph is composed of entities. And these entities are genes, antibiotics, uh, uh, molecular function, biological process. And these nodes are connected to other nodes via relations or edges. So a gene can activate another gene and a gene can confer resistance to an antibiotic. So the idea is to take in all this information and learn from it to predict new relations between existing entities. So uh, a new gene conferring resistance to an antibiotic. So uh, the idea is to predict whether a gene confers resistance to an antibiotic using this approach. And our approach is inspired by Google Knowledge Vault where they they scraped data across the web to automatically build these knowledge bases, and then they built these prior models to infer new facts. So our knowledge graph is currently composed of nine different sources uh, and, uh, that, that are categorized into five groups. Uh, MIC profiles, growth profiles, expression profiles, meta phenotype microarrays, and other existing knowledge bases. Our entity types are genes, antibiotics, cellular components, biological processes, and molecular functions. Um, the knowledge graph also contains edges or relations between these entities. Um, a gene can activate another gene. A gene is a cellular component. A gene can repress a gene. And a gene can confer resistance to an antibiotic. We have a total of 12 relation types, and four of those are negative versions of four of the positive edge types. So the architecture or the, the high level overview of how we're going to infer over this knowledge graph is we're taking two disparate approaches um, 
and then combining the approaches to kind of have this fuse model to exploit the powers of the two, two uh, disparate approaches. So it's separated into four stages. And the first stage is we're going to take a candidate edge um, and, and, and run it through two train models. One is called the path ranking algorithm, which is an observable graph feature model where uh, the features that are produced for this model are readily observable over the graph. And then the other model is a deep neural network uh, where you pass in all the edges in the knowledge graph uh, to produce uh, a score. And this provides you a holistic perspective when making your predictions. Uh, the PRA is more of a, um, it's more of a localized perspective. Uh, but I'll be getting to the specifics on these uh, in, the, in the coming slides. But then after that, when you produce a score for the specific edge, uh, we need to first calibrate these scores to, to make them comparable to one another. And then finally, we use these as features to an ensemble or a sequence of uh, weak learners where we perform a consensus vote or a majority vote to, to indicate whether or not that edge should exist in the graph. So the entity relation multilayer perceptron. It's a latent feature model. So what I mean by latent is basically uh, the, the features generated from this model are not readily observable over the graph. Um, they are automatically generated through this neural network and in kind of like a black box approach. So it's latent. Um, the inputs to this model are the three, uh, are the two uh, entities in the single relation uh, to, to represent that edge, uh, but they're, they're numerically represented as, an, as embeddings. Um, and then it's followed by three dense layers, then finally a single, uh, a single feature uh, to produce one, um, one confidence score of whether or not that edge should exist. And we trained this on the eight positive edge types uh, because the negative edge types uh, showed significant overfitting. So the way you train these types of models is you use uh, a, a loss function called margin-based ranking loss. And the idea behind this is you don't need negative edges or or uh, you know, false cases to train this model. The way you do this is you take all, all the edges in your knowledge graph and you, um, you, you produce a score for those edges, for each one from this, from, uh, you, you pass it through this neural network and you produce a score for each one. And then with every single positive edge that you have, you corrupt it by replacing either the head entity or the tail entity with a uh, random entity uh, that would produce a new edge. It's not necessarily false, it's not necessarily true, but it is, uh, we want to rank this score of this new corrupted triplet by a max margin of one uh, against this, uh, of, against the positive triplet. Um, so after you train this, um, an interesting thing about this is all these entities, all these relations are embeddings and they're randomly initialized at first. But after you train this neural network, You'll notice that if you plot the entities using TSNE uh, dimensional reduction, you'll see that the entities of type gene all cluster together semantically. And now all the entities of type molecular function all cluster together uh, semantically. And, and I never had to actually tell the ERMLP what exactly uh, an entity is of, of what type. It, it simply just learned it on its own. So the path ranking algorithm, the, the observable graph feature model that we're using. And this gives us a more of a localized perspective over the graph by using paths as features to this model. Uh, and paths, what a path is, is a sequence of relations linking two entities. Um, and, and you use these paths to classify whether or not an edge should be true or false in this knowledge graph. Again, we train this on the eight positive relation types. Um, so, so to kind of illustrate how you actually uh, find these paths uh, that we're going to use to, uh, or, or find the paths that are most important in predicting whether or not there should be this edge, edge that exists, what you do is you perform random walks all over this knowledge graph. You take all the positive edges that currently exist in the knowledge graph of, of confers resistance to antibiotic, and you perform random walks starting at, this, uh, at the gene, and you'll see where it ends up. Uh, and wherever it ends up, that'll be considered a, uh, a path and you perform this for every single sample. And even if you end up at the wrong, uh, the wrong antibiotic uh, when you perform this path, you'll still take that into account as another feature that you'll use. Um, because that'll represent perhaps negative instances of where an edge should not exist. Um, so you take all these paths and these will represent our features. So this will build our feature space. And then you'll have a label indicator of whether or not that, uh, that edge is uh, true or false. And then you train it by using a standard loss function like log loss, hinge loss, or exponential loss. So, so then finally, once you have these two trained models, you have the, the ERMLP, 
uh, which is a, a latent feature model, which is really good at providing a holistic perspective over the graph because you're using all the edges uh, when you make your prediction. Or the PRA, where, or an observable graph feature model, where you, where you use kind of a localized perspective approach because you're performing a random walk that's local to that actual specific edge uh, and finding the past locally to make your prediction. Uh, it has been shown that using uh, a combination of these, to combine these, uh, has shown to be able to exploit both, both types of powers uh, in, in when making your prediction. So to do that, we had to calibrate these models, the, the scores of these models. Uh, so we did, uh, there's, there's two popular approaches, uh, isotonic regression and, and plat scaling, but we found that isotonic regression is showing um, a bit better results, so we went with that to calibrate our models. And then we, feed, we, we, we take these calibrated scores and then we feed them into uh, another set or, or an ensemble of classifiers as features. Um, and we train these classifiers. They're, they're all weak learners. Um, each one is a one level depth decision stump. Uh, and we use aided boosted uh, training where every iteration you, you modify your training set by uh, uh, by upweighting the classifications or the samples that the, the weak learner, learner was incorrect in classifying. So then uh, after, every, after, after all these classifiers are trained, then you perform a majority vote uh, to determine uh, whether or not the edge is true or false. So the method of evaluation, how do we actually evaluate this model to make sure that it's actually doing what we want it to do? So what we did was we created a test set that included 73 unique antibiotics. And each antibiotic um, uh, had 100, uh, 100 samples for us to evaluate it on. We had one positive edge of converged versus the antibiotic for that specific antibiotic. And then we had 99 known negatives that we sampled from our no negative list that we have. Um, and this, this, in the end, this produced 7,300 samples in total. And the goal was to predict that correct positive edge out of the, the total 100 candidates uh, for each antibiotic. So in terms of results, in terms of how we're doing overall, uh, the ROC curve for all three uh, models performed pretty well. The stack, the ERMLP, and the PRA. The PRA had the highest overall a, uh, area under the curve, and uh, you want a higher area under the curve to show um, essentially how well your model is able to rank uh, the positives above the negatives. So a perfect 100% would be a, a perfect score. Uh, so the PRA has about a 90%, which is pretty good. Uh, the stack did drop a little bit to 84, but um, we weren't optimizing that model for, our, or for AUC. We we're optimizing it for actually average precision. So if we look at the average precision or the area under the curve for the precision recall curve, um, and the precision recall curve is a better model for unbalanced data sets. And since we only have one positive for every 99 negatives, uh, that's, uh, we, we, we presented our precision recall curves as well. And as you can see, the PRA has, has a fairly good uh, average precision of 50%. Now the baseline in this case is 1%, so they're all three models are significantly above this baseline. But the PRA uh, has shown to be uh, fairly superior in terms of making its predictions. Um, and the stacked is at 37%, but you'll notice that the stacked, uh, the stacked model actually performs a little bit better uh, at, at further end recalls. Um, and it, it appears that the ERMLP is not working too well, but as you see in the next coming slides, the ERMLP actually provides a, a significant benefit to the stacked ensemble. So the results. So what we did uh, was, was we also determined an optimal threshold using a validation set. Uh, uh, using our validation set, we, we determined a threshold to perform a classification over, over our test set. Um, and we optimized for F1 measure. So this threshold was optimized for F1 measure. And any score that was above this threshold would be classified as true. And any score that was below this threshold would be classified as false. And then we, uh, we provided the confusion matrix statistics. Um, as you can see, the PRA and the stacked have about the same F1 measure right now. Uh, and the ERMLP is lagging behind at 15%. Now, one of the reasons why the ERMLP might not be pre uh, performing as great as the PRA and stacked is because our knowledge graph is not as big as uh, some other knowledge graphs, so it's hard for it to generalize predictions, um, as well as the PRA. But if you look at, if you look at each individual antibi antibiotic that we're actually predicting on, and if you look at the actual edges that are, that are in our knowledge graph that we're training on, uh, and you look at how many edges of that antibiotic exist, 
you'll see that of the antibiotics that exist in our test set that have no edges to train on in our knowledge graph, zero edges, so it's just an orphan node in our knowledge graph, you'll see that none of the models were able to predict on them, and that's because there was, no, there was nothing to really train on. So none of them could actually predict on six of the antibiotics in our, in our test set. But if you move on, if, if you start adding edges, if you start looking at antibiotics based on the number of edges that it's linked to, that, have, uh, that, have, uh, that it's linked to, you'll see that the PRA performs really well, well when there's a limited number of edges for that antibiotic to learn from. The PRA is able to perform this localized approach in identifying with a, a reasonable uh, performance uh, whether or not um, uh, that gene will confer resistance. Uh, and has a relatively high recall at lower, at lower levels. But if you, start note, if you start looking at the antibiotics that have more edges uh, uh, connected to it in the knowledge graph, you'll see that the PRA starts losing its performance in recall, and you'll see that the ERMLP actually improves. So the ERMLP is actually really good for, for antibiotics that actually have a limited number of edges in the knowledge graph. Um, and then if you look, you'll see that the stacked ensemble by combining these two approaches can actually do relatively well in all categories. So the PRA does really well for, for antibiotics that have low number of edges represented in the knowledge graph, uh, but the ERMLP actually works very well for antibiotics that have high number of edges. Um, but the PRA appeared to work better because there was more antibiotics that had limited number of edges in the test set. And that's just more of a common case for, for antibiotics in general. So, so, the, so a, an, a, a, nice, a, a nice outcome of this is the stacked ensemble is actually working using the, 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 uh, the benefits of this observable graph feature model and this, uh, this uh, latent feature model. Uh, so future work, we're still, we're, we're still taking into account different uh, training regimens for the stacked ensemble that we think will help improve the model. And then we're, we're, we're looking into incorporating the use of these negative relation types during our training of the ERMLP and PRA. However, these negative relation types, they're not really a common characteristic of knowledge graphs, uh, and we have tried using them, and they, they did cause uh, some overfitting. Uh, and then finally, we're going to uh, you know, fi uh, experimentally validate some of these results in our wet lab and actually uh, aim to predict uh, some, some new, new edges, some new cases of where genes are converting resistance to common antibiotics. Um, so as a closing, um, you know, first off, we're extremely thankful about what, what Blue Waters has provided in terms of computational power uh, and the team there as well. Um, they've been very helpful. Uh, in terms of lab members, uh, my advisor, first off, uh, Dr. Tagopoulos, uh, you know, this was his vision in the first place, and he's the reason why I was able to work on this. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Uh, and then also, of course, Min Sung. He's a senior lab member in the lab. And, um, the knowledge that he has and, and, and what I've been able to learn from talking with him uh, through the numerous discussions that we've had, he's been very helpful. And then finally, also other, just other, you know, either lab members or just, um, you, know, um, you know, helpful people like uh, Dr. Dr. Lau, who was one of the authors of the Google Knowledge Vault, who invented the path ranking algorithm. He helped me in, uh, in, in better understanding it, and, and, and we had great discussions throughout about the path ranking algorithm, um, and he also provided his code for, for myself to modify. Um, so there, there's been a lot of help, and, and um, you know, everybody you know, um, that I've mentioned uh, deserves some credit as well. So that's it. Uh, that's all I have.